to cheat them. While the class is in progress, you're going to have to. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who to. So I know who to call. Wow, we made it on time. Can you do me a favor? Can you just go to the bathroom and get me a napkin? My nose is running. Get your name tags out, folks. All of you. Check your laptops. Hmm? I don't know what you're looking at it, so long as that's all it is. It's very. Yeah, yeah. And 386 is the attendance poll. And some chalk, my nose begins running. Chalk makes my nose run. It's amazing. Okay, morning, everybody. Let's begin. Please get your name tags out and shut your laptops once again. Okay, shut your laptop. Okay, just fill in the poll and shut it. Okay. Let's begin. It's a long class, so uh, we have to be a bit quick. The story so far, what we've seen, neural networks are universal approximators. They can model any odd thing, provided they have the right architecture. But we must train them to approximate any function, which means we must specify the architecture and learn the weights and biases for the function we're trying to learn. They are trained to minimize the total loss on a training set. We're going to do this through. Empirical risk minimization. Guys, can you actually get me a sheet and pass it around so I need to make sure that everybody who's supposed to be in class is in class? Uh, there's a distinction between folks who signed up for the you know, class and those online, right? And so, and the neural networks are trained to minimize the total loss in a training set, through, which we do through ERM. We use variance of gradient descent to do so. So this is the gradient of the error with respect to network parameters, which is computed through back propagation. We remember all of this, right? And the way we do it with the loss is the average divergence over all of our training samples. The gradient descent rule itself uh, goes through every layer and computes the, uh, updates the parameters against the gradient of the loss with respect to the current network parameters. and uh, that gradient, in turn, is the average of the derivative of the divergence for each individual training instance. And back propagation is actually used to estimate this derivative. So the thing, again, is that we are minimizing the loss. Back propagation merely computes the derivative. Nonetheless, using common terminology, we will often just refer to the whole process as back prop. Again, you must remember that backpropagation is not an algorithm to train a neural network. Backpropagation is a technique to compute derivatives. It's an abuse of terminology, but we will use it simply because it's done so in the literature. And when we say backprop, sometimes we will mean the entire process of training the network using gradients derived using with, through backprop, okay? So, one more. Why is this not working? happened here. And so this was the overall process. If you were trying to train a network, you would first go through all of the training instances. Each training instance is going to first be for passed forward through the net. 
then you have a backward pass where you compute the derivative of the divergence for that training instance against all network parameters. You aggregate these derivatives. And then finally, you update your network parameters using the uh, derivative of the total loss, which is the aggregate over all training instances. And so here's your first poll. That's poll number 380. Is Fadi open? It is, yeah. A different poll showing up? Right, right. You get it? Go zero zero. Yeah. Let's go zero. All right. Maybe this is a confusing poll. Can somebody answer me the question? Which one was it? Giovanni. Which was it? So here is how we defined it, remember? If I had some vector y, which affected some vector z, do some linear transform, a matrix W, and then the z in turn influenced a scalar loss, then how did we define the derivative of the loss with respect to W? Okay, let me write it this way, the derivative of the loss with respect to W. What was this? Anyone remember? Guys, Ketan, what was it? The derivative of that. Derivative of the error is corresponding to the previous equation. Is that what the, the derivative of the loss with respect to W was here? What was it? We did this in the last class, right? So it's been barely 48 hours. Yes, maybe you can tell me. So the der if this was a n cross 1 vector, if this was an m cross 1 vector, what was the size of w? Anybody? m cross n. What was the size of the derivative of the loss with respect to w? Can you say that aloud? It's a transpose of the shape of w, correct? Remember that here? OK. And so now, based just on this, what can you tell me about the derivative of the loss with respect to W? You were in class, weren't you? So we're, it's already forgotten. Does anybody else remember? Shut your laptop just for my, yeah, OK. So does anybody else remember? Folks, you're the brightest and the best on the planet. I expect you to hang on to simple things like these for 48 hours. So we'll wait, somebody on Zoom. Ajay. The first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, derivative of the loss with respect to Z. And? Derivative of Z with respect to Y, okay. So what is the size of this? One cross M. What is the size of this? M cross R. It's a function, it's a vector that's a function of a matrix. How many terms do we have in all? It's going to be a cube, is it not? So that is a tensor, that's a cube. But is that what the derivative eventually turned out to be? So somebody else, can you recall, please, for me? You're wasting time, so I'm just going to wait till somebody tries to recall. Yes? It's going to be a matrix. What was the matrix? <laughs> At 8.10, I will give you the answer. At which point, it will be shame on you, right? Because I've wasted 10 minutes on this simple question. Somebody give me an answer, yes? The transpose of the derivative of 
transpose of the derivative of L over Z. Times, uh, okay, what would the size of this be? The first item is M. M cross M1. This would be M cross 1, correct? This is 1 cross M. So this product is going to be M cross M. Is that the size of the derivative of L with respect to W? The size of, what is the shape of the derivative of L with respect to W? It was N cross M. So yeah, you're halfway there. Can you finish the answer for me? Yes. The transpose of that. So The transpose of that. So this, the derivative of the loss with respect to W was Y, the first term, times the derivative of the loss with respect to Z the derivative for the second term. Does this ring a bell? <clears throat> Somebody? If it rings a bell, can you raise your hands? Four. What happened to the rest of you guys? OK, I've got to put like eight copies of this in the quiz. Right? Because that's the only way you guys are going to remember, right? OK, take note. This is going to have, like, we're going to have a whole bunch on this one for the quiz. We're going to make this up, OK? Uh, seriously. All right, let me begin. So. That was 10 minutes, thank you. In the next class, be a bit more prepared So, I'm, because I'm going to ask you questions from what happened in the previous class. And these are not particularly complicated things, but it are, these are things that you are expected to just pull out of your hat on whim. If you go out to an interview, guess what? They're going to ask you something of this. If you give them the same blank face that you just gave me today, are you going to get the job? No, thank you. So be sharper, OK? So we're going to ask, try to ask some questions. Does backcrop always work? And what does it mean for it to converge? And some, some other stuff, right? Now, uh, we, this is what we're going to cover over the next few lectures. But start with this one. Is backcrop always right? Meaning, does gradient descent find the right solution even when it actually finds the minimum of your loss function? So remember. What was the loss? Was the loss the actual objective we were trying to minimize? But there were two different things, right? If I'm trying to perform a uh, classification task, what am I trying to minimize when I'm optimizing my classifier? The, the number of misclassification instances, uh, you know, the count of the misclassified instances. But what am I actually minimizing using the gradient descent? The error, which is the proxy, the second term, right? So, and why are we using the second term as opposed to simply the, simply the count? Continuous. This is continuous. The count is not differentiable. We saw that over here, I could move the threshold all the way from here to here without there being any change in the count of misclassified instances. So I get no idea whether I should continue doing that. Whereas if I Use, if I modify my activation function to being smooth and continuous, and if I change my, the definition of my error to the length, the to a cumulative length of these dotted lines, there, when I move in the right direction, it tells me it's by moving in the right direction. But will this always give me the same answer as directly optimizing over here? Or is the second instance likely to make mistakes, horrible mistakes, when you don't want it to. Anyone? OK, there's a bell. OK. So somebody has got to give an answer. Yes? I wouldn't say that it, it's likely to, but it's, it's possible. It's possible. Under what conditions? Um, if you minimize towards like a, a local minimum versus the global minimum. It does, you don't even have, I'm speaking of a global minimum. Is it likely to make an error when I have a, find a global minimum? Where did I put my chalk? Okay, thank you. So, yes. It will reflect the jump or the step that you're taking are too big. Is it only when, it's, when there's a jump? Can you give me any other conditions when this would happen? Okay, how about this? I have six instance blue instances, right? And how much error will the six blue instances add cumulatively in the worst case? Six, right? So if I suppose I have one trillion red instances. Does the curve ever become exactly one? No, right? So 
will the one trillion curve red instances always have an error with respect to the curve? They will, right? And what would the cumulative be? It could be arbitrarily large, right? And how do you reduce the error? Sacrifice the blue ones. I push the curve out left, right? And so if I have a very large number out here, then if I move this blue, the curve out to the far left, that distance will go down enough that the cumulative mass of error for the red dots is going to go down. And so is that the classifier you really want? No, right? So does this mean that minimizing this proxy will give you the correct classifier? Yes or no? Uh -huh. No. Can you speak up? No. Thank you, right? So anybody else? Questions? There's a very nice paper by Brady and, and uh, uh, Sloney in 1989, Brady, Ragman, and Sloney, which gives us this very nice example. So let's say I have this training data, very large numbers of blue, red, and red dots, okay? Now, that, the dotted line is a perfectly good linear classifier, right? I'm going to be comparing two classifiers. One is the threshold activation learned using the perceptron rule. And what do we know about the perceptron rule? If there is a linear classifier, it will find it, right? Every single time. Okay. Now, the second classifier is going to be using this proxy loss function, which is optimized using backdrop. In this case, both of them are going to find more or less the same classifier, okay? But now, I add this one instance, which they call a spoiler. Is there a linear classifier here that I can find? Yes. Will the perceptron rule find it? Yes. What about the backdrop? What will it do? Oh, it's going to sacrifice the one, because there are like a billion of the reds and the blues in the clump. This is a solitary instance. That's probably going to move that, wiggle that thing from that dotted line to the red line, right? On the other hand, suppose I, give, I place my spoiler there. What happens? The perceptron rule is now going to find the dotted blue line. Backdrop, it's going to wiggle things a little bit, right? Or if I move, the, if I move my spoiler out there, what happens? The perceptron rule is going to find the correct classifier. Backdrop, not very much. So what do we find over here? Pardon me? A mix of both. No, no, no. So there are two different rules. The perceptron rule never makes a mistake. But is that the behavior you really want? Why? That one instance is most likely an outlier, right? It's noise. And, and so what we're going to find is that uh, the uh, perceptron may change greatly upon adding just one single instance to a mass of a billion instances. Backpropagation is not going to do so. So the perceptron rule will always find the correct classifier. It's unbiased in the sense that if there is a correct answer, it will find it, regardless of how widely it must swing in response to a single instance. So you're saying it's too sensitive? To... It's too sensitive. It's, it's unbiased. It's always going to find the correct one, but it has very large variance in the sense that moving one instance can may move your solution from one extreme to the other, as we just saw. Whereas backdrop has low variance. It's not actually going to move the solution very much unless it sees sufficient evidence. But it comes at the cost of occasionally sacrificing an instance or two, right? So backdrop is, prefers consistency over, pre over, over perfection. It's a low variance estimator at the potential cost of bias, whereas the perceptron rule is a an unbiased estimator, but possibly with high variance. So which of the two would we prefer? Backdrop. So although we say that it might not find the correct solution, maybe it's not, we, we, we do not want to find the correct solution. Right? Clear to everybody? And this is not restricted to single perceptrons. If I have an MLP, MLPs can learn uh, pretty wicked curve functions. So for these data, it might find the red curve, right? If I add one spoiler out there, wait. If I add one spoiler up there, the MLP is not going to swing off and go change the entire curve to include that spoiler. It's going to change just a little bit. And so it remains unbiased even in the most generally. Uh, it's, it's going to have low bias even in the more general case. Questions? OK. 
So back prop will often not find a separating solution even though the solution is within the class of functions that is learnable by the network. This is because the separating solution is not a feasible optimum for the loss function. The loss function is, not, is minimized at some place which is not the separating solution. And the resulting benefit is that the backprop trained neural network has lower variance than an optimal classifier for the training data. Clear? Right? Okay. Okay, uh, someone want to give me the answer, Leo? Okay, fine. Now, the example in statements, we assume that the loss objective has a sim single global optimum that can be found. And so the statement about the variance that we, state, that we gave, made also assumes that uh, there's a global optimum. What about local optimum? It turns out that your loss function actually has many little dips, typically. It's an ugly function. And so it's going to have a pretty ugly shape. And you can have multiple local optima. And more often than not, you have lots and lots of these saddle points. The saddle point literally looks like a saddle. If you look at this red dot, at this location, the derivative in every direction is 0. But this is a maximum along this direction while being a minimum along this direction. So saddle, these are, in large networks, saddle points are much more common than local minima. And one does tend to get stuck. That's a common observation. You do have lots of local minima. But then it turns out, uh, the math tells us that when there are lots and lots of local minima, the local minima are themselves kind of equivalent. The difference between the loss values at these different local minima is not very great. And uh, however, these guys tend to dominate and will sort of bias the solutions. That's, a, that's an issue. So, the story so far is that neural nets can be trained via gradient descent. Backprop is used to derive, derive the derivatives. It is not guaranteed to find a true solution even if it exists because uh, minimizing the loss function doesn't necessarily minimize your error, right? And for large networks, the loss function may have a very large number of unpleasant saddle points or local minima which backpropagation might find and get you into a solution that's not the one that you want. That's one thing. The other is convergence. We are speaking of gradient descent, which is an iterative solution. It's taking one step at a time. Will taking one step at a time get you to the solution that you really want? So uh, it's hard to analyze for an MLP because as we saw, the loss function for an MLP is hideous. And so how many of you have heard of the street light effect? This common joke. Someone loses their key in a dark bar. It's too dark to see anyway, so they go and search under a street light. Because heck, you might as well go look where you can actually see. Right? And there's some logic to it. And this is what we are going to do. We have no idea what the loss function for the MLP looks like. But we know how to analyze convex functions. And so we're going to analyze convex functions. Right? What is a convex function? Anybody? Does anybody know what a convex function is? Where if you draw like a chord between two points, the chord will always slide off Yes. So a convex function is a function of this kind, where if I take any two points on the surface and draw a line, the function it's always going to lie above the surface. If I have a function of this kind, is this convex? Because if I take this point and this point and draw a line, it goes below the function, right? We're going to analyze convex functions. And uh, so we can similarly define convex sets. What's a convex set? Anyone? Yeah? Is there a set that is defined by a convex function? A convex set is one of this kind where if I take any two points within the set and draw a line between the two. Every point on the line remains within the set. 
So if I have a set of this kind, is this convex? This point and this point, if I connect them, it goes outside the set, right? So typically, we would like to analyze convex functions operating over convex sets because these are easy to understand. And convex functions, of course, have this nice property. You know, they're both shaped. We're going to look at issues of convergence. An iterative algorithm is said to converge if eventually it gets to the solution you want it to get to. So in the case above, that at each step, it sort of keeps going either monotonically or statistically towards the solution and eventually arrives at the solution, yes. When you define a set, the set has a boundary, so, right? Now, but you can also have behavior of this kind where it sort of goes towards where you want to, but then it keeps bouncing around. Is that behavior we want? That's jittering. And then you can even have worse behavior, pathological behavior, where instead of going towards the solution, it keeps going further and further away. That's a diverging algorithm. And we want to determine whether our gradient descent is going to converge, jitter around, or diverge, and what are the conditions for this? So uh, for this, we're going to analyze convex functions. And I'm going to spe analyze specifically a very particular kind of convex function, quadratic functions. What does a quadratic function look like? Anybody? Parabola, give me a formula for it. Mm -hmm. Can you? AX squared plus AX squared plus BX plus C. I'm actually going to put this half over here for convenience, okay? Now, this will have a shape of this kind or maybe this kind or this kind. When is it going to have a shape of this kind? A if A is positive, if A is negative, it's going to be this kind. So we're going to assume A is positive, right? Now, quadratic functions are probably the nicest convex functions. If it's less than quadratic, think of something like y equals mod of x. Is this convex? No? This is going to look like this, right? It's convex. But then here is the thing. If I'm take, performing gradient descent, the slope always is the same. If I'm using a fixed step size, I don't know whether I'm at the bottom or not, right? If I'm using a fixed step size, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to go do this, bounce, 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 bounce. I will actually never get to the bottom. If I have a quadratic, the slope is great far away from the minimum. It's shallow at the minimum. So at the, uh, you know, because your step is proportional to the magnitude of the derivative, you're going to get a large step over here. And then your steps are going to get more careful and you will converge to the solution. But then you can have some things which are super, you know, it's, are steeper than quadratic, like x raised to four. x raised to four is also convex, but x raised to four is going to look like this. And what's wrong with this guy? Out here, you're going to take a large step, which is great. Out here, it's basically flat. Your steps are going to become tiny, and you'll actually take forever to get to the solution. So we like to use the quadratic function as some kind of a standard for what is a good convex function whenever we want to perform our things like gradient descent, and we're going to be comparing our function to quadratics. Everybody with me? Okay, now, if I have a quadratic function of this kind, it's going to have a bowl shape, right? If I want to find the location where the function is minimum, how do I find out where the function is minimum? I can equate the derivative to zero and I can get a solution for it, right? So, and I can get it in one step. Can I not? Okay. But then I can also use gradient descent. And if I'm using gradient descent, I'm going to start off at, say, if my variable is w, I'm going to start off at some w zero. And I will use a rule wk equals wk minus one minus eta times d whatever the function over dw at wk, right? This is what I'm going to do. And this will keep taking steps towards the minimum. Is there a value eta at which regardless of where I begin, I'm going to get to the optimum in one step?
Anybody? Is there a value of eta where, where I'd get to the optimum in one step? For a quadratic. For a quadratic. No, regardless of where I start, I want to get to the minimum optimum in one step. There is, okay? And so how many of you have heard of Taylor's, Taylor expansions? You've all, you've all been through college, right? So how many of you have been through college? Okay, how many of you have heard of Taylor expansions? Okay, you there at the back, the lady with the white coat. Uh, can you give me, what's your name? Pardon me? Eva. Eva, okay. If I take a value w0, what is the Taylor expansion of this function around w0? So I'll call this, hang on. I'll call this w squared, just to make it sure, right? I'll call this f of w. What is the Taylor expansion around W0? Can someone help her? What is the Taylor expansion around W0? You there? The lady looking at me, or all of you? Yes, yes. Okay, can you give me the actual formula? So let me actually note this down. This is for the record, right? And then here is what we do. A Taylor expansion is an expansion that makes sure that the, if you truncate it at the kth position, the first k derivatives are the same as the first k derivatives of your actual function. Okay, so what is the zeroth derivative of the function? the function value itself. So I'm going to say f of w0. This is my uh, Taylor expansion of w at w0. And is the zeroth derivative the same on both, case, both sides? At w0, is the first derivative the same on both sides? The right side is not a function of w, right? So what is the derivative on the right-hand side? Come on, what is the derivative of a constant? Somebody, everybody else, zero together. Zero. Okay, so what is the derivative on the right-hand side, the first derivative? Zero. Everybody together? Zero. Okay, so how do I fix that? I would have to add the first derivative, right? And so I'm going to say plus f prime of w0 times, and obviously, if I just write f prime of w0, this doesn't have a derivative. So I have to multiply with w. But then if I just multiply this with w, the value at w0 becomes wrong. So I'm going to say w minus w0, correct? And now the first two derivatives are on both sides are the same. What about the second derivatives? Are they the same? Okay, so how do I fix that? I would add the second derivative. And so I'm going to say f double prime of w0 I can't say that just w squared, because if I say w squared, when I take the second derivative, there's a two that comes out. So I will put a half to make sure that that doesn't happen. But then it's not enough to just write w squared, because then the first and second derivatives are gonna be wrong, so this is gonna be w minus w zero squared. And you, keep, you can keep adding things like this. That's the basic idea behind Taylor expansions, right? Can I add a third derivative on the right-hand side? Yes? Does a quadratic have a third derivative? Okay, so are the first and second side, the left and right hand sides exactly the same? They are both quadratic and they both have the same values, right? So fine. And so if I can write it in this manner, then based on this guy around here, what is the location of the optimum? I can, let me write this, let me pull the board down. And so, I'm taking a bit too much time on this, so I'm probably gonna be slow for today's class. I'll make up for this in the next class, okay. So we have f of w 
equals f of w0 plus f prime of w0 times w minus w0 plus half of f double prime of w0 times w minus w0 squared. This is what we found, correct? So if I take the derivative with respect to w, what does it become? This has no derivative with respect to w. So this okay. becomes 0. This is going to become f prime of w0, right? And this is plus 2 and half cancel. It's going to be f double prime of w0 times w minus w0, right? Everybody with me? OK. And this I'm going to equate to 0. Right. Everyone with me? OK. So in that case, what do I end up? I'm going to find f double prime of w0 times w equals f double prime of w0 times w0 divided by uh, f prime of w0, is it? No, wait. This is? Plus. OK. So uh, minus f prime of w0, right? This is plus and this is minus, right? OK. Ah, I'm, am I making the right? If I move this to the other side, that's what it's going to be, right? Minus. And so if I divide both sides by f double prime of w0, this goes away. And this is going to be f double, f double prime of w0, right? Everybody agree with this? Now let me equate this. Or generally, so this is my solution, right? So I can just write in general w star equals wk minus 1 over f double prime at wk times f prime at wk, correct? Everybody with me? So if I equate it with f wk plus 1 equals wk minus eta times f prime of wk, what is the value of eta at which I'm going to get to the solution in a single step? One over the second, the second derivative. And what's the second derivative of the quadratic? Just a. It's fixed. One over a, right? And so did this make sense to all of you? The optimal step size equals one over a. With that step size, I'm always going to get to the solution in one step, right? What if my step size is smaller than that? Going back to this one here, I know that the optimal step size is 1 over a. What if my step size is smaller than that? What will happen? Starting from this point. I will take more steps. Oh, so if eta is less than 1 over a, I'm going to go down like so. Correct? If eta is greater than 1 over a, what happens? I'm going to go here, 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 right? Is there a value of eta where I will not converge? Is there a value of eta where I will not converge? Anybody? What is it? If I say take 2 over a exactly, it's going to go from here, we'll go back here. If it's greater than 2 over a, it's going to go out. Make sense to everybody? OK, so very cool, right? The behavior is easy to understand once you begin looking at quadratics. And so for eta greater than 2 times the optimal eta, you're going to diverge. For eta equals twice eta opt, you're going to bounce. It has to be less than that, right? And if I have a non-quadratic function, I can always write a quadratic approximation to the function, and the same principle still holds. Your step size has to be less than twice the second derivative, or it, it is not going to converge, right? Now, that's for a function of a scalar. What about a function of a vector in a vector space? 
if I have a vector space, I still have the same situation. Do I not? I have my input now as a two, let's, let's just assume I have two dimensions. Now my input is a two dimensional vector. So the actual quadratic function is now going to have the form half if my vector is w1, w2, then it's going to be w transpose a w, which is a scalar, plus w transpose some b, where b is also going to be a 2 cross 1 vector, plus a constant. And this one is going to have a bowl shape, a bowl or a saddle. If A is a positive definite, it's going to be a bowl. Okay? Everybody with me? I can actually draw now. If I look at this, if I expand this out, let's take a simple case. A can be any matrix, okay? But I'm going to, just for illustration purposes, I'm going to assume that A is diagonal. If A is not diagonal, it's like rotating the entire space, so that's all it is. So if I say W1, W transpose AW, this is going to be W1, W2. I'm going to assume that A is diagonal, A1, 1, 0, 0, A2, 2. This is W1, W2, right? This is a half. Plus W1, W2 times B1, B2. And just because there are two components, I'm going to write plus C2 plus C over 2. This is my quadratic. It's still the same quadratic, right? Everybody with me? And I can simply write this as half of A11 W1 squared plus B1 W1 plus C over 2 plus half of A22 W2 squared plus B2 W2 plus C over 2 for a diagonal A. Everybody with me? Can I hear a cumulative yes? yes? Thank you, right? Including those of you who are looking at your table rather than at the board. Okay, uh, so that's what it's going to look like. If I have many components, I can just write this in this manner, okay? I can draw level sets of the quadratic. It's a bowl. I can slice it at different heights. And if I slice it at different heights, I'm going to see rims. And so the level sets are going to look like that, right? And what is this really? Along one axis, it's going to be a quadratic. Along the other axis, it's a quadratic, a different quadratic. And in this one, where is the function steeper? Along y or along x? Along x, because the ellipses are narrower, right? And now, again, where do you want the step size to be smaller? When the function is steeper or when the function is larger? When the function is steeper, you want the step size to be smaller, otherwise you tend to, will tend to overshoot. So is the optimal step size on the x-axis the same as the optimal step size on the y-axis over here? No, they are different, right? They're going to be 1 over a11 in one case, 1 over a22 in the other case, and you expect a11 to be much greater than a22 because along the x-axis it's steeper, right? And also, for different values of w2, all that changes is this guy changes. If I just keep changing w2, as a function of w1, it's just going to be this quadratic plus different constants, right? And so the optimal value of F1, w1 is always going to be the same regardless of w2. Make sense? Right, and so also, if I fix w1, regardless of the value of w1, this is the function that you're going to be minimizing. w1 just keeps changing the height. And so the optimal value of W2 is going to be the same as the, regardless of the value of W1. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. Now, the optimal step size is going to be different along the two dimensions. Everyone with me? Okay. So now, so now let me ask you this, without even getting into pictures, okay? Getting into the slides. Let's say the optimal step size, so let's say I have a function that looks like this. And this is my function. 
And so let's say the optimal step size in this direction is say one, but the optimal step size in the horizontal direction is half, okay? So if I start from this point, if I choose a step size that's equal to one, what happens? What will happen? And let me, actually, let me actually make this one over three, right? So what will happen? In the vertical direction, in one step, it's going to get to the optimum. In the horizontal direction, it's going to bounce. So it's going to go from here to here, then here to here, then here to here, then here to here, and then here, and there, to, there to there, right? Although in the vertical direction it converged, in the horizontal direction it's going to bounce around. Okay. Suppose now I had uh, a step size which was, uh, say, less than the optimal step size for the uh, second direction, one over three or less. What will happen? It's going to converge instantly along this axis, right? But over here, it's going to be very slow. So it's going to go take forever to get here. So you see the trade-off over here, right? And the issue you will find is that, you know, in the first case, the step size that we are taking allows for convergence along the vertical axis, but it's going to result in a divergence in the horizontal axis. In the second case, uh, the second case is the same, right? Now, in the third case, both of them are below the, uh, twice the optimal step size. So you're sort of converging, right? And so the key point is this. The real challenge is that the behavior is going to depend on the, ra the, the ratio, how far apart the optimal step sizes are in the different directions. You want the step size to be smaller or equal to smaller than twice the optimal step size for the steepest side, but this can result in very slow convergence in the other sides, right? If you try to make it converge fast, fast on, you in the corner, can you shut your laptop, please? Thank you, right? Again, if you want to see your laptop, go outside, finish your job, and come back in. Not in class, okay? So. So we have this problem that the different directions can have different optimal step sizes. And if we try to conform to something where the step size is large, you're going to end up diverging. If you try to conform to the directions where the optimal step size is small, in the other directions, you're never going to converge. You're going to take forever, right? And so it turns out that uh, the learning rate must be smaller than twice the smallest optimal learning rate for any component, but this makes the learning rate, otherwise the learning will diverge, but this rate makes the learning rate really uh, small and uh, the convergence to be very slow for uh, other directions. And the, direction, the convergence may not even be monotonic, it may keep bouncing around, depending if it's between opt and two opt, then it keeps bouncing, it converges, but it bounces across the optimum, right, as we said. And the same thing happens if you have, if, it's, if the function is not convex. I can still approximate it as a convex function using Taylor series approximations. And again, the same behavior happens. If you just analyze the Hessian, which is the second derivative matrix, and if you analyze its eigenvalues, then the largest eigenvalue is going to give you, it, the uh, inverse of the largest eigenvalue is going to be the optimal step size for the steepest direction, right? But then that's actually going to be a horrible uh, step size for other directions. And if you try to follow the, uh, use a step size that is appropriate for the other directions, it's going to diverge in the directions where the eigenvalues are really uh, large, right? And so that makes sense, all of it, okay? And so convergence really depends on this ratio, yeah? If you take the inverse of one of the smaller eigenvalues, then the step size is going to be large. Right? The eigenvalue is the A. Yeah, okay. Correct. So, and so basically, you want to look at the ratio 
of the large of the optimal step size, the largest optimal step size and the smallest optimal step size. And if this ratio is large, you're going to have trouble converging. If the ratio is small, then you can actually make things converge pretty quickly. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, easy, okay. Uh, there's a whole bunch of slides on that, but then there's another question. All of this is based on the con concept that we really want things to converge cleanly, right? Is convergence important in the first place? So let's say I have a loss function of this kind. Suppose I manage to finagle my loss function or find a step size so that it will always converge. Now, my loss function may, uh, you know, much, much of the analyze, analysis we saw was based on trying to ensure that the step size was not so large as to cause divergence, right? But suppose I have a loss function of this kind, and I begin inside that small bowl. If I choose a step size that guarantees convergence, will I converge to the correct solution? So what do I need to do? Initially, I want to diverge, right? I want to get out so that I can get to a local, uh, to a bowl which is deeper. Now for a good function, deeper bowls are going to be wider and local minima are typically going to be smaller, right? Unless you get something very steep, in which case it's not a very nice function to begin with. So, uh, so here is what you want to do. Initially, you want the step size to be large enough so that you have a good chance of escaping any local minima. And then you want to decrease the step size with time. So if you are actually in a bowl, which is likely to be a local global minimum, that bowl is going to be large. Even if you begin moving up initially, if you decrease the step size, eventually you're going to begin going down, right? Whereas if you are in a local minima, when you begin going up, you're actually going to end up in a different bowl. And so if you keep bouncing around, eventually you'll end up in a bowl that's large enough where going down further is going to get, get you a better optimum. That makes sense to everybody? And so, uh, for the loss function is not convex over here. So having eta greater than two times eta opt, where eta opt is the uh, inverse of the uh, smallest eigen, eigenvalue for the Hessian matrix at that point. If, it's if your uh, initial learning rate is greater than that, then you're going to begin diverging, but you don't always want to keep it large. So over time, you want to shrink it, yes. So after we jump out of the local minimum, how do you prevent it falling into you cannot. So the point is you just want to, uh, the whole point is that if your step sizes are large enough in the beginning, eventually you're going to end up in a bowl where steps along that size are not going to take you out of the bowl. Those bowls are probably good minimum because they're deep, right? And so start with a large learning rate greater than two, meaning greater than two times the optimal. But if I normalize my loss function, I can just think of it as two. And then gradually reduce the step size with iterations. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, yeah. Uh, why isn't it better to start with uh, multiple initializations and converge? You can try that. It's, it's just going to be a lot more, uh, much more expensive, right? Restarting is something people actually do. And so how can you actually decrease your learning rate with iterations? A number of different schedules have been proposed. So for example, the most common one is you start off with a large initial learning rate, eta zero, and then over iterations, you're just going to keep decreasing it as you know, eta k is eta zero divided by k plus one. Or you can make it quadratic, eta zero by k plus one squared. Or you have other kinds of uh, learning rate schedules. All of these are based on the principle that you really want your learning rate to be large in the beginning because you will escape local minima, and then you want it to shrink so that eventually, over time, you're going to find yourself in a bowl which is large enough that your step size is going to still get you to the minimum. But then you can't have too large a step size. You'll keep bouncing around, so you want to shrink it. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. Now, uh, so gradient descent can miss obvious answers. We saw this. But this may be a good thing, right? Because you, you can get out of, uh, 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 firstly, we saw that gradient descent may find a minimum which is not what minimizes your classification error, but that can actually be a good thing. Second, convergence issues arise. The loss function has many saddle points, although maybe not so many bad local minima, and gradient descent can stagnate at saddle points. 
and vanilla gradient descent may not converge or may converge too slowly. So the optimal learning rate for one component may be too high or too small for other components. Questions? Yes, no? Okay. Yeah. Did you raise your hand? No. Cool. Okay, I'm, I'm going to begin calling out the names that have been assigned to you. This, answer, this question is going to be answered by Purple Leopard. Who is Purple Leopard on Zoom or are you here? So Purple Leopard, what's the answer to this question? Purple Leopard? Did you guys actually get your names? Yes. Okay, Purple Leopard is absent. Please mark him absent. Okay. Thank you. Can I, uh, give me another name. Okay. Green turtle. Who's green turtle? Oh, if you went to the attendance, you actually got the names, right? So who's green turtle? Okay, green turtle is absent. Give me another name, right? Uh, okay. And who is mint leopard? Okay, mint leopard. What's the answer to this one? So step sizes that are twice the, greater than twice the inverse of the second derivative can cause gradient descent to diverge, right? This is true. This is always a bad thing, is not true, correct? And uh, it will not converge without learning decaying rates. That is also not true. It, will, it can converge, OK. Guys, be awake. I'm going to call out your names, OK? Questions? Anybody? Yeah. We are lucky enough, and we start from the global minima. If we go this way, it gets a chance to escape from the global minima. If your initial learning rate is too high, then yes, it might happen. But typically, global minima tend to be in big bowls. So even if you begin going back up, you'll go, you're, eventually you'll go back down. Right? So. OK, so here's what we found. Divergence causing learning rates may not be a bad thing. For ugly loss functions, decaying learning rates provide good compromises between escaping poor local minima and convergence. So many of the convergence issues arise here because we are using the same learning rate along every direction, right? This must have stared you in the face. If I'm using the same learning rate against the, for the horizontal and vertical directions, something that converges in the vertical direction is going to diverge in the horizontal direction. So what is the obvious answer? Anybody? Different learning rates for different directions. But then what is the best learning rate for the different directions? It's hard to find out, right? So we're going to have to come up with heuristics. OK. And so there have been a, a, a great many uh, solution, uh, solutions proposed. Problems arise because we, want this we have assumed that this, we are doing gradient descent which means you have a fixed learning rate and you're walking against the gradient. But this means that you're using the same learning rate in every direction, right? Because the learning rate is being applied to the gradient. If I use different learning rates for different directions, is it still gradient descent? Can you shut your laptop there? Okay, fine. If I use different steps or different directions, uh, is it still gradient descent? Why not? Can you hear? Speak up. It's, it's not actually the direction you want to decrease. It's not the direction of steepest descent, right? A gradient descent would mean that you're taking a step that is along the gradient. All you're doing is increasing or shortening the length. But if you're using different learning rates for different directions, it means the length along different directions is going to be different. Suddenly, you've gone away from, what have we gone away from? Gradient descent, right? And so that's what we actually end up having to do if you want to get around this business of learning rates, which will cause differential learning rates for different directions, right? And so they have been, but then the problem becomes how do we decide what the optimal learning rate is for each direction? And 
what the uh, best, you know, you know, I can think of it in two, two ways. I can think of it as manipulating my derivative itself, or I can think of it as manipulating the step size. Both of them are strictly equivalent, right? Or I can think of it as some combination of the two. So if you're going to use heuristics which can combine both these principles. Now the earliest techniques uh, did something simple, much simpler. R prop was probably the earliest method which attempted to sort of decouple the directions in an attempt to get to the optimum without getting stuck in these situations where what was good for one direction was bad for the other. And here, here's how R prop operated. It's called resilient propagation. It's very simple. It has to be followed independently for each component. You use a step size that is specific to each component. Every associated with each parameter that you're optimizing, you have a step size. And you choose the step size on the fly. So here's how you do it. Uh, forget about what's on the uh, slides. You can, pictures will tell the story. So let's say this is my last function. And I start off over here. Then is the derivative there going to be positive or negative? At that point, give me a name. So Olive Falcon, is the derivative there going to be positive or negative? Olive Falcon is absent, OK. Uh, Emerald Rabbit, is the derivative there going to be positive or negative? Emerald Rabbit is also absent. Thank you. OK, this is horrible. Uh, Navy hummingbird, is the derivative there positive or negative? Uh, I think it's negative. It's going to be negative, right? So, if the, so, which means that, do you want to move forward or backward? Navy hummingbird, do you want to move forward or backward? Uh, you move forward. You want to move forward, right? So here's what you're going to do. I can come up with an initial step size and based on the si sign of the derivative, the derivative is negative, I'm going to take a step forward. If I, if I take a step forward and I check the sign of the derivative here, and the sign of the derivative is still negative, what does this mean? Am I going in a good direction or a bad direction? Do I want to increase my step size or decrease it? Increase, because I'm doing the right thing, right? So the next time around, I'm going to take a longer step some alpha times my previous step size. Will alpha be greater than one or less? Greater. If I'm increasing the step size, what will it be? Greater or less? Can I, can I hear some enthusiastic answers? Yes, Logan, greater than? Greater. greater, right? He's a doctor. Guys, you've got to be more enthusiastic than a doctor. <laughs> it's on the slide, too. Thank you. Uh, all right. And so now, over here is the derivative is still negative, right? Am I going in a good direction? Yeah. Okay, so should I increase my step size further? And so I multiply it again by alpha. And now what happened? The derivative sign changed, right? I've, what does that mean? I have overshot, correct? Then what, what, what would you suggest in this condition? I can go back and reduce my step size and start all over again, right? Such a simple algorithm. All you're looking at is, okay, what is the sign of the derivative over here? What is the sign of the derivative the last time I took a step? If it stays the same, I'm going to increase the step size. If it has changed, then I'm going to go back one step, reduce my step size, and then repeat the same procedure. And eventually, it's going to end up at the minimum, right? So uh, that's... There's a lot of there are many squiggles on the uh, uh, slides, but the concept is very simple. And the thing is, how does backprop figure over here? How do you think backprop figures here? Anyone? So maybe I can ask uh, Green Tiger, how would backprop figure over here? Uh, I think backprop is used to, to calculate those derivatives here. You would use backprop to just find the derivative and find the sign of the derivative you're not even using the value of the derivative itself, right? Because the step size didn't look at the value. You had some step, then you increased or decreased it, right? It's a very, very simple and cute algorithm. And yet, it's incredibly effective. And you're gonna be doing this independently for every direction. 
just as, uh, as uh, checks, they introduce some barriers. So if the step size becomes too large, then they cap it. If the step size becomes too small, they floor it. But other than that, the idea itself is fairly simple. I have some pseudocode for it. This is called rprop. And rprop does not look at the value of derivative, only the sign. And all it's doing is saying, you know, I've gone in some direction. Is this good? Yes, the derivative is still negative. I'm going in the right direction. I'm going to increase the step size. Right? And keep doing this, yeah. So how do you define a threshold for two large objects? That's heuristic over here. Typically, you know, five and one is kind of come up. 0.1 or something of that kind, right? It's a step. It's not eta. It's the actual step that you're taking, the correction that you're taking, right? You're not, it's not a multiplicative term. I'm saying I'm going to change w by 1. This is good. The next time around, I'm going to change my w by 1.2. Oh, I overshot. So I'm going to go back. It was 1.2. I'm going to shrink it to 1 and then try it again, right? That's it. Yeah. Wouldn't that get stuck in local minima, like, pretty easily? So for here, after a few steps, if you if you overshot, then how large is your step going to have been at that point? It's a, it's going to have been pretty large, right? If you've taken a large step and overshot, what is the depth of the bowl? What's the width of the bowl? Deep. It's it's, it's big and deep. It's likely a minimum, okay. right? So if our prop actually progresses for a few steps before you begin changing sign, then the odds are you've actually found a pretty decent local minimum, yes. So this is for like a really deep, narrow function? Those are horrible loss functions. Nothing works there. Okay. Right? So uh, those are nightmare loss functions, and we'll pretend they don't exist. Right? <laughs> this is how all math works. You eventually run into a problem that doesn't work, so you ignore it. It doesn't happen, right? So everyone with me? Yes. Why does it not use the magnitude of the gradient here? This is the simplest thing. All you're saying, you could, but this is the, how the algorithm was designed. All you're saying is, I'm going to take a step. If this was good, I'm going to take a longer step. Am I going in the right direction? If you use the magnitude, it ends up being a slightly different algorithm, right? This was the trivialest algorithm you can think of because checking the sign of the derivative is really simple, right? And so, it turns out that it works. It works better than most contemporary algorithms still. And if you're using PyTorch, R prop is probably one of the optimization algorithms, optimizers you will find on PyTorch. You can try to run it and see how good it is compared to other methods, right? Uh, okay, it's a remarkably simple first order algorithm that's frequently much more efficient than gradient descent and can be competitive against some of the more advanced methods that we use today and makes minimal assumptions about the loss function. That's the key part of it. It doesn't assume it's convex, nothing of that kind, right? It's a bowl, but the bowl need not have been convex. This would work even if you had a, you know, x raised to four kind of bowl because you're only looking at the sign, right? Whereas if you're using actual gradient descent where you are considering the magnitude of the derivative, if I had a loss function which was like x raised to six, x raised to six is going to look something like this, Gradient descent would do this. R prop is going to just get there very quickly. So I can actually show you loss functions where R prop will guaranteed work better than gradient descent. Questions? Yeah, okay. And so Teal Hummingbird, wake up. You're the next person answering my question. Okay, teal hummingbird, what's the answer? Mm. What is the answer? The second. Pardon me? The second one? Second one, does everybody agree? <laughs> right, so, okay. So the derivative is currently positive. After taking a stop, step, the derivative becomes negative. What does that mean? You have overshot, right? So then you're going to go back, 
and then take a smaller step. Simple one, right? Simple logic. Okay. But either one could work. But the way we just defined it, we said the first one is the uh, simpler solution. Yes. So you can go back. You know that it was positive, right? You know it's going it was going down forwards. You overshot. Now it's going back down backwards the other way. So you could either turn around or go back to where you were and then repeat with a smaller step. That's it. Right. Anyway, and so you have other similar methods, quick prop, which employs Newton updates with empirically derived derivatives, uh, which quick prop was actually invented by Scott Falman and CMU and remains one of the best algorithms to date, although currently it's not very popular. So here's what we have. Gradient descent can miss obvious answers. As we saw, it's a good thing. Vanilla gradient descent may be too slow or unstable to the difference between the optimal step sizes for the dimensions. And so uh, you have things called second order methods that I have not actually gone into. But then what does a second order method do? If I have different, uh, when is the whole thing going to have problems? Optimal step sizes are different for the different directions, right? So suppose I have a loss function which looks like this, even if it's convex, then which one has the, the smaller optimal step size, x or y, in this case? Right. Y is going to have the x. x, right? So this is a problem. But then what would be a simple solution for me to actually try to make the optimal step size the same in both directions? Mm -hmm. I can rescale the x-axis, right? If I stretch the x-axis, now this is going to become circular. And then the optimal step size is the same in every direction, right? And so a second order method where you multiply the, uh, the, the, the space by the inverse of the Hessian function basic, basically scales every direction such that the eccentricity in each direction is now the same. And now a single step size is going to work for every direction. So uh, that's what second order methods will do. They normalize the variation across dimensions, but computing Hessians is very complicated for big models like neural networks. Adaptive or decaying learning rates can improve convergence, and methods that decouple the dimensions can also improve convergence, right? But we still have this issue of, you know, we know that we want to have different steps in different directions. So, uh, you know, the way to do it is to figure out different step sizes for the different directions. But maybe we also even want to modify what we call our derivatives in the different directions. So these are two principles that we can generally follow, right? Let's look at the second one. We are going to redefine our notion of a derivative. And the whole idea is that when you're computing derivatives, these can be noisy, right? We'll revisit this in the next class. So when I have dimension independent learning rates, the solution will converge smoothly in some directions but oscillate or diverge in other directions. So in this case, for the first one, it's converging along y, but oscillating along x, right? Uh, and so, whereas in the third one, it's converging along both directions. But even here, what we find is that along y, x, it's not converging smoothly, it's bouncing around before it gets to the solution. So can we use this behavior somehow to our benefit? What we can do is to keep track of oscillations. Which are the directions where the learning rate is too great? In the directions in which it's oscillating or the directions in which it's not oscillating? The one where it's oscillating is where the learning rate is step size is too great because you keep overshooting, overshooting, right? So we can keep track of the oscillations. And if you're oscillating, you're going back and forth and back and forth, you're going to say, I can do one of two things. I can change my definition of the derivative or I can decrease my step size, right? We're going to do the former. So what we will do is maintain a running average of all past steps. So if I maintain a running average of all past steps, what I'm doing is maintaining a running average of all the derivatives. So I'm no longer using the instantaneous derivative. I'm using the average derivative over all of the iterations, right? And so what will happen is that in directions, where you're going, heading towards the optimum smoothly, the running average is still going to be a large value because you're not overshooting, you know, you're not changing direction. In directions where you keep overshooting and coming back, 
the overshoots and undershoots are going to cancel each other, right? And so the derivative estimate is going to become a smaller value. So here's what we are going to do. At each point, the basic gradient-based method is going to give you a step size in a, against the gradient, right? But instead, if I, if I have a current step delta w, which is my running average of my, uh, of my uh, steps, then from this, I'm going to say alpha times delta w plus one minus alpha times whatever is suggested at the current point by the gradient. So I'm making a running average of all the instantaneous steps, and I'm going to use the running average. And whatever is suggested at the current step is simply going to be negative of the gradient, right? So one minus alpha times the whatever step size I choose is what I'm representing as eta. So this is going to be, the actual step is going to be this guy, where this is some beta times the previous step, plus one minus beta times whatever is suggested at the current location, which goes against the gradient. And that is what I'm going to be updating my uh, estimate by, right? And so if you do that, here's what will happen. If I've got vanilla gradient descent, it might just oscillate in this manner over here. But once I begin using the uh, running average, you're going to find that the oscillations along y get compressed because sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, and so it's going to get compressed, and along x, it's going to stay pretty steady, and so it converges to the optimum much faster. And here is a nice thing. In the process, I haven't actually tried to learn an optimal step size for each direction. What I'm doing here is not changing the step size, I'm changing my definition of the, of the derivative, of the gradient, right? So uh, this, is what we call the momentum update, in the sense that whatever we're, we're assuming that in the process of heading towards the optimum, we have a momentum, which means there's a great tendency to continue going in the same direction that we were going earlier with some modifications based on the current location. And so point nine, the beta is the momentum factor, how fast you continue along the previous direction. And the second term, eta, is how much you deviate from it because of what the current value of the derivative is. Will make, make sense to everybody? Yeah. And so, uh, again, pseudo code for how you could actually implement that when you're training with momentum, right? So here's how the momentum technique would work. Let's say uh, at the current step, you've taken a step from, a, you, you've taken a step shown by the red arrow to get to the current location, right? Now, the derivative, the gradient, is always going to be orthogonal to the level set. You remember that we said that? So the gradient step is going to be like so at that point. And so our momentum method is going to say, I'm going to take a small step against the gradient and also some scaled version of the step that I took earlier, a scaled version of the red line, right? And so this is going to be my final step, right? Next time around, I'm going to take a derivative uh, which is at 90 degrees to the green line, which, which is at 90 degrees to the level set at the second point. And then I'm going to extend it by, by some, some scaling of the green line, and that is going to be my final step. But here is, here's the thing you observe. What we did, I can, I can break it down into two, uh, two components. I just first took a step against the gradient, then took a step parallel to my previous step. And that gave me the final overall position that I arrived at, right? So I computed the gradient here, took a step, and then took a step that was parallel to the previous step. I can change the order. The order I can, instead, I can take a step which is a scaled version of the previous step. I can continue forward, and then compute the gradient, and that is going to be my final step. So it's still the same operation. All that, that happened was I changed the order in which I do the two, did the two things. In the first case, I found the gradient in the current location, took a step against it, and then took a step that was parallel to my previous step. And the second case, step, case, I took a step that was parallel to my previous step, found the gradient, and then went against it. The second method is called Nesterov's accelerated gradient, and it turns out that this method is, in fact, just this little change of order. 
results in a great improvement in convergence, and this actually converges provably faster than the similarly uh, either vanilla gradient descent or momentum updates. So again, all of these are still ways of changing the manner in which we are defining the direction in which, which we are moving. The learning rate itself is still an independent factor, right? So uh, here's a comparison from Hinton. The blue curve shows you what you would do with momentum, and the colored curve lines, other colors, show you what you would do with Nestor's method, right? Converges much faster. So again, we're going to return to all of these things soon. What we have done so far, okay, there's a point. Who's gonna answer this one? Again? Yeah. Okay, that doesn't matter. Mint seal, you are, the, you are it. Okay, mint seal. Where's mint seal? Mint seal is absent. Okay. Uh, Navy panther. Who's Navy panther? Navy panther is also absent. Nice. Navy panther. No, N A V Y. Okay. Yeah. That's you? Okay, so you're a panther. No, no, I'm calling for the panther. Who's lime woodpecker? Yes, is that you? Okay, what's the answer? That's false, right? Guys, momentum only changes the, uh, on a flat step, on a flat surface, momentum is not gonna change anything, right? If every their derivative is exactly the same as, as every other derivative, the running average is the same as the instantaneous derivative. And so things will not change, right? So, okay, so uh, to conclude, methods that decouple the dimensions can improve the convergence of gradient descent. And momentum methods, which emphasize directions of steady change. Uh, and one way to do this is to actually decouple the step sizes and have not be strictly dependent on the instantaneous derivative and redefine your gradient itself. And that's what momentum methods do. And these, uh, which emphasize directions of steady movement, move improvement are demonstrably superior to other methods. So we'll stop right here. Uh, and in the next class, we'll begin looking at incremental updates, uh, stochastic gradient descent, and so on, and why they work. Right? Thank you for your time. Thank you.